So imagine for a moment if you are the parent of a child with a chronic illness and the medicine that you give that child every night could kill him if you get the dose wrong, just a little bit long. Now imagine for a moment that the dose that you gave him yesterday that worked doesn't work today for some reason. And imagine that you have to worry about this every single day for the rest of your child's life. And finally, imagine that you have to send that child off to college one day and the full burden of that responsibility falls on your child's shoulders. And the worry of that child being able to get up and take on a new day was always ever in your mind. So if you can imagine all that, then you can imagine what it is to be a parent of a child with type 1 diabetes. So about 15 years ago, my wife Toby, who had been a practicing pediatrician at the time for just a year, diagnosed our son David with type 1 diabetes. He was only 11 months old at the time. He nevertheless had this constant burden that he had to deal with and would have to deal with for as long as he had diabetes, which potentially is the rest of his life. I think of everybody with type 1 diabetes as being either the boy or the girl who lived. That first night when David was diagnosed, I can remember my wife crawled into the crib. It was really a small hospital bed in the ICU, and she curled herself around his tiny self. And while I really didn't know or appreciate fully what life had in store for us after that, um, all I could really remember, the thought that came to mind, was that the, really the only difference between nightmare and reality is that well, reality lasts longer. So it was a pretty scary moment, but not too long after that, I began to think about a way in which I might be able to help build a technology, or at least contribute in some way to building a technology that could automatically take care of David's blood sugar levels so that he wouldn't have to. Now, my background was in applied mathematics. I, um, I used to study the way biological systems worked, and I used mathematics as a principal tool to do that. But it turns out that, you know, while I didn't think I could find a cure for type 1 diabetes, those weren't my skill sets. Um, I did think I had the skill sets that I could lend to this problem of building this automated technology. And what really began as uh, essentially a a research project, it was really a hobby at first, it then grew into a research project, but ultimately it turned into an all-consuming, determined effort to build an automated glucose control system, a bionic pancreas that would take care of David by the time he goes off to college in just 27 months. Not that I'm counting. I had no idea, really, what all of that would entail when I took this on. So I think what we need to do first is just step back and, and talk about um, what is type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder, and it's an autoimmune disorder in which a person's T cells perversely attack the insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas, leaving them uh, deplete of any insulin. So what does that really mean? Well, it turns out that insulin itself is extremely important for glucose regulation, and what it does is it shuttles glucose sugar from the blood into uh, fat and muscle cells where they can use them for energy and storage. So what happens when someone has diabetes and they don't have insulin anymore, bef prior to the discovery of insulin, people would be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and they would begin to waste away and they would ultimately become catabolic and very lethal ketones would build up in their blood and they would ultimately be poisoned and die. It was essentially a death sentence. So a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes was a worse diagnosis than cancer at the time. So it turns out that uh, when this was discovered, uh, people survived a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, but ultimately they needed to manage their blood sugars in such a way as to stave off the long-term complications. But this wasn't known for decades. It wasn't understood what was happening. People were surviving diagnosis, but they were suffering from long-term chronic complications of diabetes. These include heart disease, stroke, 
blindness. It's a very dangerous, long, scary list of complications. People's lives were, were plagued with morbidity, and their lifespans were shortened dramatically for decades after insulin therapy. So it wasn't until about 70 years later that people started to, clinic, cl the clinical research scientists began to realize what was going on here, and they conducted a trial, a seminal study, called the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, in which they looked at whether or not lowering your blood sugar levels could stave off long-term complica complications of type 1 diabetes, or at least reduce them. And it turns out that's exactly what they showed. In a 10-year-long study, they were able to discover that if you could lower average blood sugar levels in people with type 1, you could stave off the long-term complications, and they could live healthier lives with less morbidity. Well, that was all well and good, but it turns out that there was a catch. And the catch was that while you could stave off long-term complications with good insulin therapy, the problem was that if you overdosed insulin just a little bit, you could kill people. You could have what's called hypoglycemia. See, insulin is a very dangerous substance. It's got a very high toxicity index and a very narrow therapeutic range. And what that means, really, is that a slight overdose of insulin can be lethal. And so it turns out that while we were trying our best to bring people's average blood sugars down, we were finding that in those people that were achieving those goals for therapy, they were suffering from hypoglycemia low blood sugar levels, and severe hypoglycemia could be deadly. And in fact, if you had severe hypoglycemia at nighttime, you might in fact never wake up. It's called dead in bed syndrome. And it's one of the scariest, scariest concerns of, a, of, a, of people with type 1 diabetes and parents of children with type 1 diabetes. So it really is literally keeping people up at night. So we would check David's blood sugar levels one, two, three times a night, every night, Sometimes more, sometimes less. But you have to do this to make sure that your child is safe at night. Because if you give him a little bit too much insulin, he may never wake up. So in David's case, we would give him a little bit of insulin if his blood sugar was high, give him a little bit of uh, juice if his blood sugar was low, and he would sleep through all of this, by the way, right? He would never wake up to this. You could give him a little straw and he'd suck it down, sound asleep. After all, he was only an infant when he was diagnosed, so he was nursing at the time, so he just sort of continues that reflex. But the reality is that while that is a blessing, it is a tremendously scary prospect when he heads off to college because he doesn't wake up to alarms. He doesn't wake up to hypoglycemia, where some people do, he doesn't. So the worry is what happens when David heads off to college. So whereas the DCCT, this DCCT trial showed us that we, we need to maintain as, as tight a blood glucose control as possible without hypoglycemia. It also showed us in the 20 years since then that we don't have the tools to prevent, uh, we really just don't have the tools necessary to achieve those glycemic levels. So what's happening instead is people are running high blood sugar levels or they're suffering from severe hypoglycemia. And as you'll see in a moment, the standard of care is, in the US today is not meeting goal for therapy. People are running around with high blood sugar levels, about twice the normal average. And these are leading all, to all these complications I was telling you about. The task is clear. Maintain your blood sugar levels as near to the normal range as possible without hypoglycemia. But the tools are not up to the task. So what we need is a new tool. And until quite recently, the tools that we had at our disposal were really anemic. The um, medical device industry in diabetes and the insulin, the, pharma the pharmaceutical industries in, in diabetes really were not innovating. But quite recently, they've started to make tremendous progress. And we've leveraged that progress and integrated it with our bionic pancreas to build a synergistic system that automatically regulates blood sugar and type 1 diabetes to levels that are, that are really quite close to the normal range and that stave off hypoglycemia. So what started with a, a clumsy cobbling together of a laptop with glucose sensors and pumps, uh, which we used in our first studies, turned into a slightly more elegant, albeit still cl somewhat clumsy, iPhone mobile system where all of our, our, our systems ran on the iPhone and controlled wirelessly two pumps and also controlled, uh, received glucose level from a, from a sensor. This device allowed us to do outpatient studies. 
But what we've done since then is to build a much more elegant package. We've built a true medical device that integrates all of these pieces into one single device. And we call this device the eyelet. Now, the eyelet is a single handheld unit that has both insulin and glucagon. Now, insulin, as I was telling you, is a hormone that lowers blood sugar levels. Glucagon counters that. It's a hormone also secreted by the pancreas that raises blood sugar. So these things act in counter to one another. The islet consists of three components. It's got a continuous glucose sensor, which is a body-worn sensor you change roughly once a week, and it sends glucose levels wirelessly to the device. It has in it all these mathematical algorithms that we developed, which make therapeutic decisions to determine how much insulin and glucagon to deliver every five minutes. And then it controls two built-in pumps, one to deliver insulin and one to deliver glucagon, through tiny tubes that come out of the bottom of the device and connect through little thin catheters that are placed under your skin. It has about a week's supply of drug. And this device you can put in your pocket. It's about the size of an iPhone, about twice as thick. And it truly takes over diabetes management. It's a turnkey solution for type 1 diabetes. You type in your weight, and it automatically begins adapting to your ever-changing insulin needs. With our device, we've studied subjects in outpatient studies over the past two years, the iPhone system, the predecessor to this one, uh, in, in kids, in, 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 in people six years old and as old as 76 years old, in people weighing 47 pounds and as large as 288 pounds. People have had diagnosis for one year and as much as 45 years. The, di the, the bionic pancreas doesn't discriminate against age. It doesn't discriminate against gender, against race, or even how well or poorly you manage your blood sugar levels on your own. And really, to make this point clear, I'd like to show you an example of how well this device works in just one of our subjects. This is an anecdotal example, but I think it really gives you a sense of how powerful this tool is in helping people manage their blood sugars. What you see here is the average blood, daily blood sugar levels of people of a one subject with type 1 diabetes. You can see all 11 days wearing her own insulin pump, taking care of her own diabetes. She's not on the bionic pancreas. And you can see that her, the goal for therapy, which is this green shaded region, is not being achieved day or night. She's well away from the goal for therapy every single day and every single night on her own care. And I choose this example because this is how people take care of themselves out there. This is quite typical of the national average of type 1 diabetes in this country. This is not far off from what people do day in and day out in this country with the tools we have for them today. Notice also how much variability there is from day to day. Blood sugar control is totally capricious when it comes to self-managed diabetes care. Now look what happens when this person wears the bionic pancreas for 11 days. Notice how little variability there is. Every day, she's in target range. Every night, she's in target range. Notice how little variability there is from day to day. I would like to emphasize that when she's on her own pump, when she's taking care of her own diabetes, she's working hard to get this result. This is not coming easily to her. When she's on the bionic pancreas, she's not thinking about her diabetes anymore. She's not worrying about her blood sugar levels. The, the, the bionic pancreas takes that over for her. She can be spontaneous again. She can exercise at will, as much as she wants, as little as she wants. She can eat whenever and whatever she wants. So the bionic pancreas truly is a game-changing technology. So I just want to close with a couple of comments. For one thing, the bionic pancreas is truly an innovative technology, unlike anything we've seen since the discovery and purification of insulin. It solves four of the leading concerns in type 1 diabetes management. It brings average glucose levels down in everyone to levels that would stave off all long-term complications. It controls hypoglycemia and prevents even mild hypoglycemia and likely completely eradicates severe hypoglycemia in everyone. And it unburdens people of the stress of taking care of diabetes, of, of the effort and the relentless need to comply with therapy. Because after all, the bionic pancreas is the first technology to comply with the patient rather than the other way around. And finally, the bionic pancreas unburdens people of the emotional stress 
of the fear of hypoglycemia and the worry and dread of long-term chronic complications. So I'd like to just make a comment about David now. So David is a teenage boy. David is, he just sent me a text yesterday that he's just gotten his permit and now he is driving or will be soon. Now I was a teenage boy, so I, you know, I know whereof I speak and teenage boys are not human. <laughs> teenage boys are highly complex multicellular organisms at best. They're a disconnected mass of excitable cells, but they're a danger to themselves, as I was many times over again. David once nearly stabbed himself with a toothbrush. Imagine that for just a moment. All of the worries and the fear of type 1 diabetes, and we almost lost him to stabbing, self-stabbing by a toothbrush. This is a blunt instrument. How that could happen, I'll get into that another time. But the fact is, that David literally pierced the back of his throat while brushing his teeth. <laughs> Dental hygiene is extremely dangerous among teenage boys, as is diabetes, maybe more so. But we, my wife rushed him to Boston Children's Hospital, where one fellow after another looked at this perplexing problem, had no idea what to do. They did a CT of the head and neck, and then finally the attending physician comes in. This is a 95% chance you didn't lacerate the carotid artery he shouldn't bleed out on the way home. <laughs> David has done fine since then. But I would just like to finish by pointing out that I believe that David is in good hands as long as he's with us. He's, he's well taken care of. And basically, we ha I feel like he's safe. We've, we've taken care of him from infancy to, to toddlerhood, through adolescence the whole arc of his, his young life. And I feel like as long as he's with us, he'll be safe, but the worry is when he leaves home, when he's on his own, when he's in college, and he's gotta, he's gotta check those blood sugars at night. Will he wake up at night? Will he wake up to see another day? I, we, we cannot, we must not get that phone call. So if I leave you with anything tonight, it is with this appreciation for the true risk that is type 1 diabetes, for this reality, the reality we're trying to change. So the point here is that the bionic pancreas is not a cure. People with type 1 diabetes have been told literally for decades that the cure is but five years away, decade after decade after decade. But I can tell you with great sadness that there is no cure in five years, and there's not likely to be one in 10. The bionic pancreas is no cure, but it is a bridge to a cure. The bionic pancreas is a sturdy bridge to a cure. It is the ever-extendable bridge to the ever-elusive cure. I thank you all very much.